There are many secret societies rumoured to be out there. Organisations that are said to pull the strings of the world. These groups have been both credited and blamed for various things, great and small. They're the subject of many conspiracy theories and speculations. You may have heard of the Illuminati. It's been referenced in everything from music to books to movies to games. Yet for all that we think we know about it, there's so much more that we don't. Sit back, take a breath, and listen as we shed light on the Illuminati. In Latin, the term Illuminati is the plural of Illuminatus, meaning enlightened. Throughout history, the name has been given to many real and fictitious groups. Traditionally, the name commonly refers to the Bavarian Illuminati. They were an Enlightenment-era secret society founded on May 1st, 1776. Today, Bavaria is a part of Germany. What did this infamous group do, and why have they become irrefutably influential? The Bavarian Illuminati goals were simple enough. The society was founded as a means to fight against superstition, religious influence over public life, the proliferation of knowledge, and to safeguard us from abuses of state power. The order of the day, they wrote in their general statuses, is to put an end to the machinations of the purveyors of injustice, to control them without dominating them. Today, the term Illuminati is used to reference many different organizations that have claimed to have some connection to the original Bavarian Illuminati or other secret societies. However, these claims have never been proven. Throughout the decades, many have claimed that secret societies conspire to control world affairs by planting agents in governments and corporations to gain political power and influence. They are also said to be masterminding events to establish a new world order. Let's go back to where it all began. Or at least where they would like us to think it all began. Back in the year 1773, Adam Weishaupt became a professor of practical philosophy and canon law at the University of Ingolstadt. Weishaupt was the only non-clerical professor at an institution run by Jesuits. Later on that year, Pope Clement XIV dissolved the institution. However, the Jesuits of Ingolstadt wouldn't bend. 
they managed to hold on to some power at the university. The Jesuits made frequent attempts to discredit and frustrate non-clerical staff, mainly when the course material consisted of anything they regarded as Protestant or liberal. Weishaupt became extremely anti-clerical and decided to begin spreading the Enlightenment ideals through some sort of secret society composed of like-minded individuals. Weishaupt looked into Freemasonry but found it to be costly and not open to his ideas. With nowhere to turn, he founded his society. Weishaupt's group was to have a system of grades or ranks based on those in Freemasonry, however, with his plan. The original name for his new order was Bunda Perfectibilisten, which translates to the Covenant of Perfectibility, and the members of the group became known as Perfectibilists. On May 1, 1776, Weishaupt, along with four students, formed the Perfectibilists, who used the Owl of Minerva as their symbol. All members of the society had to use aliases within. Weishaupt adopted the pseudonym of Spartacus. Law students Massenhausen, Bauhoff, Merz and Souter became respectively Ajax, Agathon, Tiberius and Erasmus Rotorodamus. In April 1778, the order changed their name to the Illuminatan Orden, or Order of Illuminati. Massenhausen was initially the most active member in terms of society expansion. He recruited Xavier von Zwack, a former pupil of Weishaupt while studying in Munich. It wasn't long before Massenhausen's enthusiasm soon became a liability in Weishaupt's eyes, as later on he became erratic due to his love life. Weishaupt passed control of the Munich group to Zwack. In 1778, Massenhausen graduated and left Bavaria. At the time of his departure, the order had a nominal membership of 12. Zwack immediately applied himself to recruiting more talented and mature candidates. Most prized by Weishaupt was Hertel, a childhood friend and a canon of the Munich Frauen Kirsch. By the end of summer 1778, the order had 27 members in five commands, Ingolstadt, Munich, Ravensburg, Freisinger and Eichstadt. During this early period, the order had three grades of Novice, Minerval and Illuminated Minerval. Only the Minerval class involved a complicated ceremony. During induction, the candidate was given a password and a set of secret signs. Weishaupt used a mutual espionage system which kept him informed of all members' character and activities. His favourites went on to become members of the ruling council. Some of the novice members were allowed to recruit. Christians of good character were actively sought, with Jews and pagans expressly excluded, along with women, monks and other secret societies. Favoured candidates were docile, wealthy, willing to learn and aged between 18 and 30. Weishaupt began finding it difficult to dissuade some of his members from joining the Freemasons, so he decided to join the Older Order as a means to acquire the material he needed to expand his ritual. In February 1777, he was admitted to lodge prudence of the right of strict observance. However, his progress through the three degrees of Blue Lodge Masonry taught him nothing of the higher degrees he was looking to exploit. The following year, a priest named Abbe Marotti told Zwack that these inner secrets rested on knowledge of the primitive church and the older religion. 
Zwack convinced Weishaupt that their order should begin friendly relations with Freemasonry to get whatever they needed to set up their lodge. During December 1778, the addition of the first three degrees of Freemasonry was thought of as a secondary project. Without difficulty, a warrant was granted by the Grand Lodge of Prussia, known as the Royal York for Friendship. The new lodge was designated as Theodore of the Good Council to flatter the Elector of Bavaria, Charles Theodore. Theodore of the Good Council was founded on March the 21st, 1779 in Munich and was quickly packed with Illuminati. The first master was a man called Radl, who was eventually persuaded to go back to his home in Baden. By July of that year, Weishaupt's order ran the lodge. The society's next step involved gaining its independence from their Grand Lodge. This was done so by establishing Masonic relations with the Union Lodge of Frankfurt, who was affiliated with the Premier Grand Lodge of England. With the proper relations in place, Lodge Theodore became independently recognised and thus declared its independence. As a mother lodge, it could now create lodges of its own. During a recruiting drive of Frankfurt-based Masons, Weishaupt's lodge gained the allegiance of one of its key members, Adolf Freiherr Koenigi. Koenigi was recruited late in 1780 at a convention of the Right of Strict Observance by Costanzo Marchese di Costanzo, a fellow Freemason and infantry captain in the Bavarian army. Whilst in his twenties, Koenigi had reached the highest grades of his order and had big plans for its reform. However, no one else in his lodge was interested in supporting his ideas. Koenigi was intrigued when Costanzo told him that the order that he wanted to create already existed. Koenigi and three of his friends immediately wanted to learn more about this order, so Costanzo showed them material regarding the Minerval grade. This grade had been banned in Bavaria, but it was common knowledge in the Protestant German states. Koenigi's three companions became disillusioned and wanted nothing more to do with Costanzo, but Koenigi persisted. He was rewarded for his persistence in November 1780, when he received a letter from Weishaupt. Koenigi's connections in and out of Freemasonry made him an ideal recruit. Koenigi was flattered by this attention. Weishaupt managed to acknowledge and pledge to support Koenigi's interest in alchemy and the higher sciences. Koenigi replied to Weishaupt, outlining his plans for the reform of Freemasonry as the strict observance began questioning its origins. Weishaupt gave Koenigi the task of recruiting before taking part in the higher grades of the order. Koenigi accepted the responsibility on the condition that he would be able to choose his own recruiting grounds. A lot of Masons found Koenigi's description of the new Masonic order appealing and quickly enrolled in the Illuminati's Minerval grade. At this time, Koenigi appeared to believe in the most serene superiors which Weishaupt claimed to serve. However, his inability to talk about the higher degrees of the order became more and more embarrassing. That didn't stop Weishaupt from giving him another task. Weishaupt provided Koenigi with material to produce pamphlets that outlined the activities of the outlawed Jesuits. Eventually, Koenigi's inability to answer his recruits' questions regarding the higher grades made his position increasingly difficult. Koenigi wrote to Weishaupt to inform him of his problems. 
In January 1781, Weishaupt finally confessed that his superiors and the supposed antiquity of the order were fictions, and the higher degrees hadn't been written yet. Surprisingly, Kanigi took this news in his stride. Weishaupt sent him all of the data that he had written thus far, and promised Kanigi a free hand in the creation of the higher degrees. Kanigi used this opportunity to make the order a vehicle for his ideas. His new approach would make the Illuminati more engaging to proposed members in the Protestant kingdoms of Germany. In November 1781, the Areopagus gave Kanigi 50 florins to journey to Bavaria, which he did. Meeting and savoring the generosity of other Illuminati along the way. The order had now extended profound internal departments. The Eichstadt administration had formed an independent province in July 1780, and a fracture was growing between Weishaupt and the Areopagus, who found him unreasonable, brutal and contradictory. Kanigi fitted comfortably into the role of mediator. In negotiations with the Areopagus and Weishaupt, Kanigi recognized two problematic ranges. Weishaupt's emphasis on the recruitment of university students indicated that senior posts in the order frequently had to be appointed by young men with little practical knowledge. Secondly, the anti-Jesuit ethos of the order at its origin had become a general anti-religious sentiment, which Kanigi knew would be a dilemma in recruiting the senior Freemasons that the order now attempted to attract. Kanigi keenly felt the stifling grip of traditional Catholicism in Bavaria and understood the anti-religious sentiments produced in the liberal Illuminati. He also saw the adverse reaction these same feelings would cause in Protestant states, hindering the spread of the order in Greater Germany. Both the Areopagus and Weishaupt felt powerless to do anything less than give Kanigi a free hand. He had the connections within and outside of Freemasonry that they needed. He had the experience as a ritualist to build their proposed gradual structure, where they had ground to a halt at Illuminatus Minor, with only the Minerval grade below and the most insignificant sketches of higher grades. The only limitations required were the need to consider the highest grades in a secrets and the obligation of submitting his new grades for approval. Meanwhile, the scheme to develop Illuminatism as a recognized branch of Freemasonry had stalled. Even though Lodge Theodore was in their control, a chapter of elect masters assigned to it only had one member from the order and still had a lawful advantage to the craft lodge controlled by the Illuminati. The chapter would be challenging to influence. Areopagus formed a natural barrier to Lodge Theodore, becoming the first mother lodge of a new illuminated Freemasonry. A treaty of cooperation was signed between the Order and the Chapter, and by the end of January 1781, four daughter lodges had been created. Still, independence was not in the Chapter's agenda. Costanza wrote to the Royal York, identifying the discrepancy between the fees sent to their new Grand Lodge and the service they had experienced in return. Reluctant to lose the revenue, the Royal York offered to bestow the higher secrets of Freemasonry on a delegate that their Munich brethren would dispatch to Berlin. Costanza duly set off for Prussia on April the 4th, 1780, with directions to negotiate a reduction in Theodore's fees whilst he was there. On the way, he managed to debate with a Frenchman on the subject of a lady with whom they were sharing a carriage. Before they reached Berlin, the Frenchman sent a message ahead to the king, accusing Costanza of being a spy. He was only released from prison with the aid of the Grand Master of Royal York, and was ousted from Prussia having achieved nothing. 
Koenig's original plan to get a constitution from London would, they realised, have been seen through by the chapter. Until they could take over other Masonic lodges that their branch couldn't control, they were happy to rewrite the three degrees for the lodges they managed. On January the 20th, 1782, Kanigi formulated his new system of grades for the order. These were arranged in three classes. Class 1, the Nursery, consisting of the Novitiate, the Minerval and Illuminatus Minor. Class 2, the Masonic Grades. The three Blue Lodge grades of Apprentice, Companion and Master were separated from the higher Scottish grades of Scottish Novice and Scottish Knight. Class 3, the Mysteries. The lesser Mysteries were Priest and Prince's grades, followed by the greater Mysteries in the grades of Mage and King. It is unlikely that the rituals for the greater Mysteries were ever written. Koenig's recruitment from German Freemasonry was far from accidental. He targeted the Masters and Wardens, the men who ran the lodges and were usually able to place the entire lodge at the Illuminati Authority. In Aachen, Baron de Witt, Master of Constancy Lodge, prompted every member to join the order. In this way, the order increased quickly in central and southern Germany and gained a foothold in Austria. Moving into the spring of 1782, the handful of students that had started the order had grown to about 300 members, only 20 of the recruits being students. In Munich, the first half of 1782 saw considerable changes in the government of Lodge Theodore. Weishaupt had offered to split the lodge, with the Illuminati going their way and the chapter taking any outstanding traditionalists into their line of Theodore. At this point, the section unexpectedly surrendered, and the Illuminati had complete command of lodge and chapter. In June, both Lodge and Chapter sent letters cutting connections with Royal York, citing their faithfulness in paying for their admission and Royal York's negligence to give any guidance into the higher grades. Their disregard of Costanza, failure to defend him from spiteful charges or stop his removal from Prussia were also cited. They had made no effort to present Costanza with the promised secrets. The Munich Masons now speculated that their colleagues in Berlin relied on the mythical French higher grades that they endeavoured to avoid. Lodge Theodore was now truly independent. The right of strict observance was now in a dangerous state. Its formal leader was Prince Karl of Sudermanland, who later became Charles XIII of Sweden, openly spoke of trying to absorb the right into the Swedish right, which he already commanded. The German lodges looked for leadership to Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel. Suspicion turned to open ridicule when it occurred that Karl regarded the Stuart heir to the British throne as the true Grand Master, and the lodges of the strict observance all but disregarded their Grand Master. This deadlock led to the convent of Wilhelmsbad. Postponed from October the 15th, 1781, the last convention of the strict observance finally opened on July the 16th, 1782, in the spa town of Wilhelmsbad on the outskirts of Hanau. Apparently, during a discussion regarding the order's future, 35 delegates knew that the strict observance in its present form was doomed to fail. The convent of Wilhelmsbad would struggle over the arrangements between the German mystics under Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel and their host Prince Charles of Hesse Castle and the Martinists under Jean-Baptiste Villemoz. 
the only dissenting opinions to mystical higher grades were Johann Joachim Christoph Bode, who was appalled by Martinism, but whose suggested choices were as yet unfinished, and Franz Dietrich von Dittfurth, a judge from Wetzlar and master of the Joseph of the Three Helmets Lodge, who was already a member of the Illuminati. Dittfurth openly campaigned to revert to the quintessential three degrees of Freemasonry, which was the least expected outcome of the convention. The mystics already had identified plans to substitute the higher degrees. The lack of a logical alternative to the two strains of mysticism allowed the Illuminati to present themselves as dependable options. Ditfirth, aided and assisted by Kanigi, who now had full authority to act for the order, became their spokesman. Kanigi's initial plan to suggest an alliance between the two orders was declined by Weishaupt, who saw no point in connection with a dying order. His new idea was to enlist the Masons instead of the Templar higher degree of the strict observance. At the convent, Ditfirth obstructed Villemoz and Hesse's efforts to advance their own higher grades by requiring that full details of such degrees be revealed to the members. The German mystic's frustration led to their enrolling Count Collerat into the Illuminati with a view to later association. Ditfirth's plan was to return all of the higher degrees with a separate fourth degree, with no demands to advance Masonic prophecies. Finding no support for his project, he left the convent early, writing to the Areopagus that he anticipated nothing good of the association. In an attempt to please everybody, the convent of Wilhelmsbad accomplished little. They abandoned the Templar origins of their ritual whilst maintaining the Templar titles, trappings and governing structures. Charles of Hesse and Ferdinand of Brunswick endured at the head of the order, but in practice the lodges were almost independent. The Germans also adopted the name of the French Order of the Good Knights of the Holy City, and some Martinists mysticism was imported into the first three degrees, which were now the only required degrees of Freemasonry. Crucially, individual lodges of the order were now permitted to associate with lodges of other orders. The new Scottish grade added with the Leon ritual of Villamoz was not mandatory. Each province and administration was free to decide what, if anything, occurred after the three craft degrees. Finally, to show that something had been accomplished, the convent governed at length on etiquette, titles and a new numbering for the provinces. What the convent of Wilhelmsbad produced was the death of the strict observance. It relinquished its original myth and the higher degrees that bound its most senior and most prominent members. It eliminated the strict control, which had kept the order assembled and divided many Germans who doubted Martinism. Bode, who was repelled by Martinism, directly entered negotiations with Carnegie and finally joined the Illuminati in January 1783. Charles of Hesse joined the following month. Koenig's first attempts at an alliance with the intact German Grand Lodges failed, but Weishaupt endured. He suggested a new federation where all of the German Lodges would follow an agreed, combined system, in the essence three degrees of Freemasonry, and be left to their own designs, as to which, if any, system of higher degrees they wanted to track. This would be a federation of Grand Lodges, and affiliates would be free to visit any of the Blue Lodges in any jurisdiction. All Lodge Masters would be chosen, and no charges would be paid to any principal authority whatsoever. Groups of Lodges would be subordinate to a Scottish Directorate, formed of members appointed by Lodges to review economics, settle arguments and approve new Lodges. 
In turn, these would choose provincial directorates, who would elect inspectors who would name the national director. This system would fix the current imbalance in German Freemasonry, where Masonic ideals of balance were protected only in the lower three symbolic degrees. The different methods of higher degrees were controlled by the elite, who could research alchemy and mysticism. To Weishaupt and Carnegie, the proposed organization was also a means to generate Illuminism throughout German Freemasonry. They planned to use their new partnership, highlighting the first degrees, to remove all loyalty to strict observance, leaving the eclectic system of the Illuminati to take its place. The new federation outlined the faults of German Freemasonry, which included improper men with money that were frequently accepted based on their assets. The degradation of civil society had infected the lodges, Having promoted the deregulation of the German Lodge's higher grades, the Illuminati now declared their own from their unknown superiors. Lodge Theodore, newly free from Royal York, set themselves up as a provincial Grand Lodge. In a letter to all the Royal York Lodges, Carnegie now cited that Grand Lodge of Indulgence. The Jesuits had supposedly hurt their Freemasonry. Strict observance was now attacked as a production of the Stuarts, empty of all moral virtue. The Zinnendorf ceremony of the Grand Land Lodge of the Freemasons of Germany was suspicious, because its writer was in alliance with the Swedes. This direct assault had the opposite effect that Weishaupt intended. It angered many of its readers. The Grand Lodge of the Grand Orient of Warsaw, which commanded Freemasonry in Poland and Lithuania, was pleased to cooperate in the Federation only as far as the first three degrees. Their insistence on independence had kept them from the strict observance, and would now keep them from the Illuminati, whose plan to join Freemasonry rested on their own higher degrees. By the end of January 1783, the Illuminati's Masonic contingent had seven lodges. It wasn't only the awkward appeal of the Illuminati that left the Federation short of members. Lodge Theodore was newly formed and didn't demand respect like the older lodges. Most of all, the Freemasons most likely to be attracted to the Federation saw the Illuminati as an ally against the Mystics and Martinists. They appreciated their freedom too profoundly to be caught in another prohibitive organization. Even Ditferth, the assumed representative of the Illuminati at Wilhelmsbad, had attempted his own plan at the convent. The non-mystical Frankfurt Lodges formed an eclectic alliance, which was almost indistinguishable in the organization and aimed at the Illuminati's organization. Far from seeing this as a threat, after some debate, the Illuminati Lodges entered the new organization. Three Illuminati now sat on the panel charged with drafting the new Masonic ordinances. Aside from establishing relationships between the three lodges, the Illuminati seemed to have gained no benefit from this movement. Ditferth, having discovered a Masonic organization that worked towards Freemasonry's goals, took little interest in the Illuminati after he adhered to the Eclectic Alliance. In reality, the Eclectic Alliance's creation had undermined all of the subtle plans of the Illuminati to spread their own doctrine through Freemasonry. Although their goals of mass recruitment through Freemasonry had been disappointing, the Illuminati continued to recruit well at an individualized level. In Bavaria, the succession of Charles Theodore originally led to a liberalization of beliefs and laws. Still, the clergy and subjects, securing their power and privilege, convinced the weak-willed monarch to change his reforms, 
and Bavaria's oppression of liberal thought returned. This reversal led to a general irritation of the ruler and the church amongst the cultured classes, which offered a perfect recruiting ground for the Illuminati. Many Freemasons from Prudence Lodge, indifferent to the Martinist rites of the Chevalier Bienfaisant, joined the Lodge Theodore. He set themselves up in a gardened mansion which included their library of liberal literature. Illuminati circles in the rest of Germany increased. Whilst some had only moderate gains, the Ring of Mainz almost doubled from 31 to 61 members. Reaction to state Catholicism led to increases in Austria, and footholds were obtained in Warsaw, Pressburg, Bratislava, Tyrol, Milan, and Switzerland. The total number of valid members at the end of 1784 is around 650. Weishaupt and Hertel later claimed a figure of 2,500. The higher value is mainly explained by the incorporation of members of Masonic lodges that the Illuminati professed to command. But likely, the names of all the Illuminati aren't known, and the actual number lies somewhere between 650 and 2,500. The Order's significance lay in its successful recruitment of professional classes, churchmen, academics, doctors and lawyers, and its more recent acquisition of powerful benefactors. Karl August, Grand Duke of Saxe Weimar Eisenach, Ernest II, Duke of Saxe Gotha Altenburg with his brother and later successor August, Karl Theodor Anton Maria von Dalberg, Governor of Erfurt, Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, his chief assistant in Masonic matters, Johann Friedrich von Schwartz, and Count Metternich of Koblenz were all enrolled. In Vienna, Count Brigo, Governor of Galicia, Count Leopold Kollerat, Chancellor of Bohemia, with his Vice-Chancellor Baron Kressel, Count Palfi von Erdod, Chancellor of Hungary, Count Banfi, Governor and Provincial Grand Master of Transylvania, Count Stadion, Ambassador to London, and Baron von Sweden, Minister of Public Education, also joined. There were well-known frustrations. Johann Caspar Lavater, the Swiss poet and theologian, rebuffed Knigge. He didn't believe the Order's philanthropic and rationalist plans were feasible by secret means. He further concluded that a society's drive for members would eventually sink its founding ideals. Christoph Friedrich Nikolai, the Berlin writer and bookseller, became disenchanted after joining. He found its aims chimeric and thought that the use of Jesuit systems to accomplish their goals was dangerous. He remained in the order but didn't take part in any duties of recruitment. At all costs, Weishaupt wanted to keep the existence of the order secret from the Rosicrucians, who already had a significant foothold in German Freemasonry. Whilst Protestant, the Rosicrucians were anything but anti-clerical or pro-monarchic and held views that clashed with the Illuminati vision of a rationalist state run by scholars and specialists. The Rosicrucians weren't above promoting their brand of mysticism with deceitful seances. A conflict became necessary as the Illuminati's existence became more prominent and as Carnegie and other over-enthusiastic helpers actively recruited notable Rosicrucians and mystics with Rosicrucian alliances. Colorat was already a high-ranking Rosicrucian and the mystic Prince Charles of Hesse Castle had a meager opinion of the rationalist higher grades of the Illuminati. The Prussian Rosicrucians, under Johann Christoph von Wallner, launched a continued attack on the Illuminati. 
Wallner had a specially engineered room in which he convinced potential patrons of the effectiveness of Rosicrucian magic, and his order had obtained sufficient control of the three globes and its associated lodges. Through this advisor, the Illuminati were accused of atheism and revolutionary aims. In April 1783, Frederick the Great told Charles of Hesse that the Berlin Lodges had documents concerning the Minervals or Illuminati, which included offensive material, and asked if he had heard of them. All Berlin Masons were now warned against the Order, which was now accused of Socinianism and of using the liberal writings of Voltaire and others, alongside the toleration of Freemasonry which undermined all religion. In November 1783, the Three Globes portrayed the Illuminati as a Masonic sect seeking to undermine Christianity and turn Freemasonry into a political operation. Their final anathema in November 1784 refused to accept any Illuminati as Freemasons. In Austria, the Illuminati were blamed for anti-religious brochures that had recently emerged. The Rosicrucians spied on Joseph von Sonnenfels and other presumed Illuminati, and their campaign of condemnation within Freemasonry ultimately shut down Illuminati recruitment in Tyrol. The Bavarian Illuminati, whose presence was already known to the Rosicrucians from a source, were further deceived by the reckless actions of Ferdinand Maria Bader, an Areopagite who now accompanied the Rosicrucians. Shortly after his testimony, it was known to his superiors that he was one of the Illuminati and was told that he couldn't be a member of both groups. His resignation letter said that the Rosicrucians didn't possess secret knowledge and disregarded the genuinely illuminated, accurately recognizing Lodge Theodore as an Illuminati Lodge. As the Illuminati adopted Freemasonry and extended outside Bavaria, the Council of the Areopagites was replaced by an incompetent Council of Provincials. The Areopagites continued as powerful voices within the Order and began again to argue with Weishaupt as soon as Carnegie left Munich. Weishaupt answered by privately attacking his recognized enemies in letters to his perceived friends. More seriously, Weishaupt succeeded in alienating Carnegie. Weishaupt had given significant power to Carnegie, deputizing him to write the ritual, power he now endeavored to recapture. Carnegie had advanced the order from a tiny anti-clerical club to a large group, and felt that his work was under-acknowledged. Weishaupt's continuing anti-clericalism collided with Carnegie's mysticism, and recruitment of mystically inclined Freemasons was a cause of conflict with Weishaupt and other senior Illuminati such as Ditfirth. Matters came to a head over the grade of priest. The consensus among many of the Illuminati was that the ritual was florid and ill-conceived, and the regalia puerile and costly. Some declined to use it, others edited it. Weishaupt commanded that Carnegie rewrite the ceremony. Carnegie pointed out that it was already distributed with Weishaupt's blessing as ancient. These interests fell on deaf ears. Weishaupt now declared to other Illuminati that the priest ritual was flawed because Carnegie had created it. Angry, Carnegie now threatened to tell the world how much of the Illuminati ritual he had made up. Carnegie's effort to develop a convention of the Areopagites proved futile, as most of them trusted him even less than they believed Weishaupt. In July 1784, Carnegie left the order by arrangement, under which he returned all critical papers, and Weishaupt published a withdrawal of all defamations against him. 
in forcing Carnegie out, Weishaupt stripped the order of its best theoretician, recruiter and apologist. The Illuminati's final deterioration was brought about by the indiscretions of their own Minervals in Bavaria, especially in Munich. Despite their superiors' efforts to control loose talk, politically dangerous brags of power and criticism of monarchy caused the secret order's presence to become common knowledge, along with the names of many notable members. The presence of Illuminati in seats of power now led to some public anxiety. There were Illuminati in many civic and state governing bodies. Despite their small number, there were many claims that resolution in a legal dispute depended on the litigants' status with the order. The Illuminati were blamed for several anti-religious writings then appearing in Bavaria. Much of this criticism sprang from vindictiveness and resentment, but it is clear that many Illuminati court officials gave special treatment to their colleagues. In Bavaria, their two members of the Ecclesiastical Council had one of them named Treasurer. Their resistance to Jesuits resulted in the banned order of losing critical academic and church positions. In Ingolstadt, the Jesuit heads of department were replaced by Illuminati. Frightened, Charles Theodore and his government banned all secret societies, including the Illuminati. A government order dated March 2, 1785, seems to have been the death blow to the Illuminati in Bavaria. Weishaupt had fled, and records and internal communications seized in 1786 and 1787 were finally published by the government in 1787. Von Zwack's home was searched and much of the group's literature was disclosed. Between 1797 and 1798, Augustin Barrowell's memoirs illustrating the history of Jacobinism and John Robison's proofs of a conspiracy broadcasted the theory that the Illuminati had survived and represented an ongoing international conspiracy. This included the claim that it was behind the French Revolution. Both books proved to be very successful, driving reprints and interpretations by others. A prime example of this is proofs of the real existence and dangerous tendency of Illuminism by Reverend Seth Payson, published in 1802. Some of the replies to this were important. For example, John Joseph Mounier's On the Influence Attributed to Philosophers, Freemasons and the Illuminati on the Revolution of France. The works of Robison and Barrowell made their way to the United States and across New England. The Reverend Jedediah Morse, an Orthodox Congregational Minister and Geographer, was amongst those who gave sermons against the Illuminati. One of the first records of the Illuminati to be printed in the United States was Jedediah Morse's Fast Day Sermon on May 9, 1798. Morse had been warned to the publication in Europe of Robison's proofs of a conspiracy by a letter from the Reverend John Erskine of Edinburgh. He read proofs soon after copies published in Europe arrived by ship in March of that year. Other anti-Illuminati writers, such as Timothy Dwight, soon followed their condemnation of the imaginary groups of conspirators. Newspaper reports followed printed speeches, and these figured in the partisan political discussion leading up to the 1800 United States presidential election. The succeeding panic also added to the development of Gothic literature in the United States. At least two novels from the time refer to this crisis, Ormond or The Secret Witness, and Julia and the Illuminated Baron. 
Moreover, some scholars have linked the alarm over the alleged Illuminati conspiracy to fears about immigration from the Caribbean and about potential slave resistance. Concern died down in the first decade of the 1800s, although it revived from time to time in the anti-Masonic movement of the 1820s and 30s. Several recent and present-day brotherly parties claim to be descended from the original Bavarian Illuminati and openly use the name Illuminati. Some of these groups use a modification on the title the Illuminati Order in their companies. In contradiction, others, such as the Ordo Templi Orientis, have Illuminati as a level within their organization's hierarchy. However, there is no indication that these present-day groups have any real association with the historical order. They haven't amassed extraordinary political power or sway, and most, rather than trying to remain unknown, promote unconfirmed links to the Bavarian Illuminati as a means of drawing membership. The Illuminati didn't survive their suppression in Bavaria. Their further mischief and plottings in Barrowell and Robison's work must be considered the invention of the writers. Conspiracy theorists and writers such as Mark Dice have disputed that the Illuminati have survived to this day. Many conspiracy theories suggest that world events are regulated and managed by a secret society calling itself the Illuminati. Conspiracy theorists have alleged that many notable people were or are members of the Illuminati. Presidents of the United States are a frequent target for such claims. Other theorists maintain that the Illuminati orchestrated a variety of historical events. The happenings include the French Revolution, the Battle of Waterloo, and the killing of United States President John F. Kennedy. There was also an alleged communist plot to advance the New World Order by infiltrating the Hollywood film industry. It remains difficult to pinpoint who the Illuminati is, what they do and what their goals are. In the end, maybe that's the point.